Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small business and good stories in general. Welcome to episode 107 of Small Business War Stories. And today, we talk bees. I sat down with Tara Dawn Chapman, who is the founder of Two Hives Honey. And we talk about beehives, we talk about the honey business, and we talk about how Tara initially got started by putting hives in people's backyards. Uh, People who wanted to uh, learn beekeeping and have access to beehives, and then she did a partnership with them. And then she would collect the honey and have honey that had the flavor of different neighborhoods, of the flowers of different areas and different regions. Um, It's a fascinating, fascinating story. And she is a complete badass. She is a uh, former uh, intelligence agent for the government. And uh, she didn't tell us too much of what she used to do because she can't. But she is awesome. And um, we talk about how she got her first job. She basically cold um, emailed some folks and she followed a really cool strategy to get into a field that she had no expertise in uh, prior and she shares that strategy and then she talks about how she um, got things off the ground now she has a really successful business in austin texas so it's really uh, a great episode not to miss this episode is brought to you by proven Proven proven.com is a company i started it is a small business hiring tool and you can check it out at proven Dot com. If you need to hire employees, we help you distribute to different job boards. And we have a great resource for you at blog.proven.com where you can learn more about different aspects of running your small business. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Episode 107 with Tara Don Chapman in Austin, Texas. And we are live here in beautiful Austin, Texas. And today I have the pleasure and honor to sit down with Tara Don Chapman, who is a founder and owner of Two Hives Honey. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's always a great day when I get to talk about bees. Yes. <laughs> you probably have a lot of puns about bees too. I hate bee puns. You do? There's one on the board right here, right behind me. That one um, was still undetermined of who wrote that. I think it was my old assistant. Okay. And I love her. Lucy, love you. And we left it up as a tribute to Lucy. Okay. Yeah, on the board right here it says, what would you call a wasp? I want to be... And then there's a little bee saying, thank you, thank you, like a comedian flying away. So great. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, let's, talk, let's talk bees and honey. Okay. What, uh, what inspired you to start this business? Okay. So in my prior life, I'm from rural West Texas, um, went to Duke University for college, had no idea what I wanted to do. And then the CIA gave me a job. And I was like, by the way, um, not the Culinary Institute of America. Everyone in Austin thinks, oh, you're a chef. And I'm like, oh God, no. Um, No, the Central Intelligence Agency. Got it. And I was like, yeah, I'll come work for you. Pentagon. (laughs) Not the Pentagon. Oh, is that different? Um, different. Yeah, oh. that would be Department of Defense. Oh, so CIA I was at Langley. Yeah, Langley. But anyway, CIA. So went there, um, worked in Pakistan and Afghanistan for the bulk of 10 years at the CIA and then at a few other entities. Wow. And you probably cannot tell us what you did there because you'd have to kill us. Not a whole... Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I did that for a really long time. Um, the bulk of it, I mean a decade and and then some and the last agency that i was at let me work um, in austin part-time so i was spending every month i would be in austin for three weeks and then i would go to dc for a week and then i would go to afghanistan every two months for two weeks for two or to two months right so three very different worlds Mm -hmm. did that for three years and i was just over it I, i wanted an exit strategy and didn't know what i was qualified to do like i only worked in dc my whole life and felt a little bit bound by my abilities hindsight being 2020 that was ridiculous um yeah but so I it's start- crazy the walls we put up for ourselves oh, right for sure I, I would say starting the business that's made me realize like i'm in a very unique position where i think a lot of us are if we if we were um fortunate enough to go and get a college education and we um, utilize that effectively, we are in a position to do 
most anything we want within yeah, even, reason. Even without a college education, like a lot of people, it, it, I think, I think they, especially with the world the way it is today, where you can learn anything online, it's almost like the only, the ultimate, the, the ultimate power skill is learning. If you know how to learn, Particularly today, yeah. I think that when we, I mean, I don't know, I don't presume to know how old you are, but when yeah, I graduated, I'm, I'm 38, so I'm probably, yeah, same age. Yeah. So, um, it was totally different. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've recognized I'm in this unique position that I, you know, I can't be president tomorrow, of course, but like if I decided I wanted to go into a new career field, I could probably figure out how to do it. Cause I have the resources to do that. I'm very fortunate. Mm-hmm. So anyway, at the time I didn't know that. And yeah. so I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I started interviewing and a million startups, really former startups around town, the Facebooks, the Dropboxes, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't. I, I couldn't. <laughs> I, I remember sitting across the table from, from some 22-year-old that asked me, like, tell me about a time that you had to be flexible in your job. And listen, I'm not above that question yeah. by any means. But come on, look at my resume. Yeah. Can you come up with something more interesting Yeah, to I was ask in me? Afghanistan. <laughs> so, I, and then I thought, well, what the hell am I going to do? And I had taken this beekeeping class and loved it. And I love to talk about bees. Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do that. Now, that being said, it took a whole lot more than just deciding I was going to start a bee company. Yeah. But it all started with a class and needed an exit strategy. Mm-hmm. And falling in love with bees during this class. Yeah. So, you fell in love with bees and you were interviewing so you were back in austin Mm -hmm. you quit your job before you took the leap or how did that go so i decided that i wanted to start this company Mm -hmm. and knew that you know i had been a beekeeper for all of six months and Mm -hmm. knew that that did not a professional beekeeper make (laughs) and so quit my job um I knew that I could try My mom was like, can you just do it on the side? But I knew that that wasn't reality. I needed to have no parachute, right? I just needed to go. Just commit. Quit my job, went and worked for a professional beekeeper in East Texas for three months. And that's kind of a funny story because um, I didn't really have the experience that they needed or wanted, right? But I presumed I could imagine what qualities they would like to have. And I had some of those. So I still have the cover letter. I cold emailed them. Mm-hmm said, I would love to work for you. And I said, I imagine you need someone that's strong. I literally gave them my deadlift and front wow. squatting All right. That's awesome. Gave them By my squatting. By the way, this, that's probably a good time to say that we met at the Atomic Athlete yes. Gym here in town. Yes. Uh, quite a few people from the from Atomic, our small business people yeah. have been on the show. Yeah. I think it, that gym begets those qualities, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You have, to, you have to love punishment. <laughs> for sure. So I gave them my squat. And deadlift numbers. Okay. Because <laughs> um, beekeeping is really hard work. Um, I knew that I'd be out in the field with, you know, probably a lot of salty characters. And so I said, I'm no shrinking violet. I've worked around the military my whole life. You know, I gave them this whole spiel and they hired me. So I quit my job, went and worked for them for four months yeah. um, to learn the trade and then came back to Austin ready to hit the ground running. Wow. Wow. So, so what, uh, why, did they, why did they give you a job? Did they tell you? If yeah. you cold email them with this, yeah. uh, that they you, you, loved your the, stats. They loved it. I remember Laura Weaver is her name. And I remember her saying, you telling me that you were no shrinking violet. I hadn't heard that in years. And that just made me laugh. And we met and they told me, you know, like they, they hire seasonally. So mm-hmm. I went into it, you know, fully transparent. I want to start a hunting company. Is that going to affect you and how you feel about hiring me? And she said something so profound. She said, Tara, when you know all boats rise together Mm -hmm. we can't make enough honey to meet the demand we love you know if we can help you do that which was great yeah are you still in touch with them right now oh for sure we work together i buy bees from them the equipment i sell from them we work together a lot so it's the relationship has benefited both of us time and again awesome which i think is an awesome you know lesson that a different way to look at your quote-unquote competitors if you will Mm -hmm. um but yeah, I think I just impressed her with, you know, throwing it out there. Like, I'm not shy about recognizing both my faults, but saying like, I will work harder than anyone else. Mm-hmm. And that has gotten me more jobs than I can count. Just saying, listen, I might not be the person you would ideally hire, but I promise you, I will work harder than anyone else that you know. Mm-hmm. It's gotten me pretty far. Okay. When maybe at moments I shouldn't have gotten very far. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So... You go to East, where in East Texas were you? Navasota. Navasota. Mm-hmm. Navasota, Texas. Mm-hmm. And you come back to Austin after three months. 
And uh, what's the, um, the the honey scene like in Austin? I don't know. I'm not familiar. So it is not a, I mean, in terms of like production, it's mm-hmm. not a big production area, meaning we don't get as much honey as they do in East Texas, not even close. We don't get what they get in South Texas. Mm-hmm. Climate's just very different. Um, but I saw what I thought was a very unique opportunity. There are other bee businesses in Austin. Mm-hmm. There's honey businesses in Austin. However, um, different flowers, different nectars from different flowers produce very different honeys. Yeah. What beekeepers do is they dump it all together and they sell it. That's why we had this very generic idea of what honey is. Yeah. But there's like a million different yeah. colors, flavors, varieties, textures. I took a few different types of honey home the last time you had an event here. And like some of them are like, I had this one that kind of tastes like molasses. It's really smoky. Mm-hmm. And then you gave me some honeycomb that was, I think, from, uh, I don't know, from the hill country. And it was like, and then there's some stuff from South Austin where I yeah. live. Yeah, so I had this idea that because we can get, when you harvest in very small batches, Mm -hmm. you can get a lot of different unique flavors and colors. And so I thought, how cool would it be if every neighborhood had their own honey from their bees that they made in their neighborhood? Yeah, And Austin's a city that's very into like, local uh, products and so i thought let's just make it hyper local and let's put bees in north loop and harvest and then say this came from bees in north loop you live in north loop cool my bees probably visited your garden to make this honey and no one was doing that um that i'd seen anywhere so that was my unique idea are people doing that in other parts of the country i have seen there's a company in australia that does it Um, I think they're called postcode honey because <laughs> uh-huh. they say postcode instead of zip code oh, in Australia. Yep, yep. Um, and then there's one other company, um, I'm sorry, two other companies in the U S that I've seen that have done it. Um, but uh, I, I, I wasn't aware of them. This was just an idea that I thought I'll do this because nobody was doing it in Austin. Yeah. Um, so we've got East Austin honey and South Austin honey and people love, you know, it makes a great gift, right? If someone moves on to the east side like and you give them honey from bees from their neighborhood like that's so cool and it connects us so much more with nature um that's right around us even if we live in the city yeah wow okay so how are you doing this how are you doing this thing where do you give people i mean how do you harvest this honey i guess it's uh, so like what's the relationships in terms of like where i put the bees yeah where do you put the bee i mean do do, do people put hives in their backyards that's something else that i do very differently um you know i don't own a single piece of land i own nothing and so when i first set out i thought well i'll just find someone that there would be some mutual benefit yeah right um big beekeepers move their bees around from farm to farm they get paid for that service for a lot of reasons that have to do with sustainability, that is not a, um, a model that I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. So I knew I wanted to find permanent homes for bees, places they could have lots of access to food and that hopefully I wouldn't have to pay for that land. So mm. we started out making different partnerships, which has been a big key to our success. So we've got some urban farms where we put bees. Yeah, They get this free pollination services, which helps their harvest you know, um, significantly. Um, and then we don't have to actually pay for any land for that. So we've got urban farms. We've got lots of private landowners that just really want to support the cause. Um, we throw some honey their way, you know, every couple of months, a member at Atomic, we have hives on his, uh, property. Is that right? Um, yeah. Tony Gonzalez and we've got hives on his piece of property. Um, and so we've got a lot of different um, relationships, but yeah, we don't actually pay any money for land. And I think it, you know, we've got a couple of spots where we provide classes to the community yeah. um, for these nonprofits in exchange for letting us put bees there. So it builds a stronger community when we're we're doing things that where it's not necessarily a financial transaction. You know, transactional relationships have a place and a purpose, mm-hmm. but we much prefer to operate where you get something tangible or you know maybe even intangible that helps your organization. And we get a place for our bees. So is it mostly people's homes or mostly commercial real estate? Like what kind? It's of? a little bit of both. Yeah, mm-hmm. a little bit of both. So some people have homes where they're like, I would love to have some hives in my backyard, and you you give them honey in exchange. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've okay. got we've got like a hostel. Um, it's a musician's hostel, and they just love bees, and they have oh, yeah? a great What's garden. Um, Euphoria. Euphoria. Yeah, that's our n- well, north. I'd have to site. check that out. Yeah, so we've got so all the the. That'd be a good interview for the they, show. They're great. They're they're like, yeah, they're great. Yeah. Um, but we've got all of our relationships work, a l- our partnerships work a little bit differently. But we're fortunate we don't we don't pay for any land. So. 
That is amazing. So uh, what are the requirements for somebody? So, I mean, I have a backyard. Is, mm-hmm. that, is that enough? Or is so that- when we first started, um, we actually started this program for folks that... So, so here's the problem with beekeeping. When you start a new hive, you generally don't get honey from that hive for a whole year. Okay, so I started this honey company and I wasn't going to have honey for a whole year. And I was like, oh, well, that's not going to work. It's easier than whiskey. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) But that's not going to work, right? I need money. And so I, um, I started this program called our Honey Homes program where people that wanted to start beekeeping, it's a very challenging endeavor. Hobbyist beekeeping is very popular in Austin, but mm. it's very hard to start what on your own. What does it take? What is, what is it? Well, it's just um, beekeep. Bees are a highly nuanced, very specialized species, and so we're not talking like putting feed and water out for chickens, right? Like there's a whole lot you can screw up. Um, it's basically I tell beekeepers if you're going to put hives in your backyard, um, you're you're agreeing to a lifetime of learning. Like we, we as a species don't even know everything there is to know about bees. Like scientists still spend a great deal of time and money every year studying, Mm -hmm. you know, bees. And so there's just a lot. So knowing that and knowing that I was teaching beekeeping classes and people still weren't actually starting their hives, I started doing informational interviews and learning why. So I started this program where people would get two hives in their backyard. We would set them up. We would take care of them for 18 months. So it allowed us to, it was a subscription fee. So you would pay recurring revenue and recurring revenue in small businesses is the gold standard. If you can figure out a way to get recurring regular revenue, you've made it, right? Mm -hmm. So right away I had a recurring revenue model. They would pay me a subscription fee. I would take care of their bees, but for the 18 months, they got classes and private lessons on their own bees. Now, everything that came out of those hives, all harvest, all honey that came out of those hives for 18 months was owned by the business. Mm -hmm. At the end of 18 months, the hives reverted to them. They now own them. They had paid their subscription fee. And they own the the bees. And they own the bees. And we walk away. So we we have phased that program out. It doesn't make sense for us anymore. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it gave me revenue immediately before I had honey. So I actually was making money on these these programs far before I had honey. So you basically got paid to learn. Um, I mean, when I first, I know a whole lot more now than when I first got started, yeah. but I'd already gone through, you know, I had worked from a, for a beekeeper in East Texas, but for sure, for, you know, like the longer, every year that I work bees, I know more and more every yeah. year. Well, I didn't mean that in a bad way. I meant that like, that's great. You, they got something out of it. They got a great setup in their backyard and you got something out of it because you got upfront revenue and mm-hmm. the experience of knowing how to set this up and run it. Yeah. I mean, it taught me a lot right off the bat about, yeah. uh, you know, learning that lesson very early on that recurring revenue is where it's at. Yeah. And we've constantly trying to figure out ways to, to reinvent that model and, yeah. and to get that. And particularly in, you know, agricultural businesses where it's very seasonal mm-hmm. and we're reliant upon live animals that are reliant upon the weather. So, yeah. you know, like I envy, someone that makes chocolate bars for a living that can source their, you know, their beans from somewhere in South America and then go in a kitchen and they're only bound by the amount of chocolate they can sell and the amount that they can make. That is not an option for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it rained, Oh my God, every day in September and October last year, I remember the huge rain that we had. I essentially had no fall harvest because of the weather. And so that is completely out of my control And so what's made agriculture so hard and so different from any other endeavor, right? So you got all the challenges that you would have in any business Mm -hmm. and then add on to it these factors that you can't control that dictate how much product you have to sell. So because of that, we are not reliant only on hunting. You know, we sell beekeeping equipment. Um, Very quickly, I varied my um, revenue streams so that I wouldn't be reliant on honey. And that way, when we had a bad season, yeah, it'll hurt, but it's not going to hurt near as bad because I'm still teaching beekeeping classes and I'm still doing, you know, hive tours and experiences for corporate teams and whatnot. And what are your recurring revenue streams today? So we have phased out that Honey Homes program. We're in our last crew now. Um, it was very popular. However, it just was very labor intensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just didn't make sense for a lot of reasons for us anymore. Um, the margins weren't huge on it. Um, and so the recurring revenue that we have now is in the state of Texas, you can get a, 
um, it's called an ag valuation on your property. It basically brings your taxes down from whatever it is to essentially zero um, on your property. You've got to have at least five acres. Um, but this was a law that has been around for a long time and they added beekeeping to the list of activities about five years ago. And so our recurring revenue today is we have clients who um, want to have bees to get this huge cut on their taxes, mm-hmm. um, but have no interest in beekeeping, right? Got it. So we have um, you know, something like 40 clients that pay us just to take care of their bees. So if you're in the Austin area and you have more than five acres, you mm-hmm. should be in touch with too high. <laughs> For sure. You should definitely look at uh, beekeeping as an ag valuation. That's yeah, awesome. it can where, really where did the name two hives come from? Uh, oh, that's a great question. So, um, I was a hobbyist beekeeper for a couple of months um, mm-hmm. before I dove in, and um, I actually started this business with a partner. That didn't last very long. Mm-hmm. He had very different ideas of, um, of of what a business would be. Um, but when we were thinking of a name for the company. Um, I was struggling with what to come up with and we had started two hives together. So we became beekeepers together. And she said, what about two hives, honey? And it just rolled off the tongue so nicely. And so that's how we, we named the company, but it's actually, it's dovetailed really nicely with what we do because when we started our honey homes program, we put two hives in people's backyards and we recommend that everyone do two hives. Why is that? Because you can share resources between hives. So you can share honey, you can share bees, you can share pollen. And so if you've got two hives, it's easier to keep those hives strong than if you just have one, right? Mm. Because if you've got one hive and something goes awry, you don't have anything to share from another hive. Mm. So I always recommend people do two hives. So that's just a nice a uh, little aside that makes the name make even more sense. That is awesome. That's like a, yeah, it's a cool name. You got a cool logo. Who, who made your logo? A friend of mine um, okay. is a designer and I had, that was probably the hardest thing I did the first year. It was yeah. like, it seems so important and it is, it's very important, right? But yeah. um, that well, was really stressful. Well, not as important as recurring revenue though. I like <laughs> that. that. You know, I will say I spent so much time and energy and frustrations on the logo that first year yeah. when really like put something together, throw it out there, figure it out later because yeah. nobody knew who I was that first year. Nobody saw it the yeah. whole first year. I still had time to come back to it later, but it just felt so important and heavy and I put a lot of yeah. unnecessary I, I also, stress on myself. I, I also did that and I would say that it wasn't right. It was, it was a mistake. Like I think that initially, like you got to worry about making sure that you're solving customers' problems and you're generating revenue. That's the number one thing. Yeah. And I, but I definitely made that same mistake of yeah. like really caring about yeah. graphics and, yeah. stuff and, I mean, and business cards and shit like that. Oh my gosh, business! I had business cards. I don't think I handed one out for six months. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those things are really important. Like branding is, you know, our honey fetches a much higher price than yeah. anyone else in town. We don't have problems moving it at that price point. That's because our branding yeah. uh, is top notch, right? We've got a we've got a very specific feel for our product. We know who our customers are, and it speaks to them. So that's very important. But, but I, I didn't need that. But I would argue. Ago. Hold on. So we've done some episodes about this recently. Uh, it, this one with Ryan Dice recently about branding, and there's one upcoming one with the uh, Wizard account. Actually, by the time this airs, it will over, already have aired. Um, but we talk about branding and branding is really not the colors on your logo, right? Branding is everything you just said, which is branding is your your feel, yes. what you do, how you do it, how you market it, the fact that you have this local flavor honey from your neighborhoods, the way you serve your customers, that's your branding. 100%. It is, I teach a class on branding and marketing your honey um, for beekeepers at a big conference in East Texas. Yeah. Um, and they asked me to do that because I'm I'm getting more for my product than anyone else in the state of Texas, mm-hmm. hands down. Um, and you're right. I always tell them like, when you look at, think about a brand that you really love, think about like a, a company you really like. And when you think about them, what emotions come up? Right. Um, and not that one emotion is any different or, or sorry, any better or worse than another, but think about what do you want people to think and feel when they look at your logo and at your product yeah. and then go from there. It's very important. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, but you, I mean, you're doing all that stuff, right? It's impressive. And you also do a lot of stuff in education, right? Like you do. We do. We do a ton of beekeeping classes. So that's been one way when I talked about, again, varying our, um, our revenue streams. So yeah. we're not 
only reliant on honey. Yeah. Um, that makes us a really different than all the other, a lot of the other beekeeping businesses around. Yeah. Most people do, you know, um, breed bees or does honey. We do a little bit of everything almost to a fault. I will admit. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do lots of beekeeping classes. And then we also do, um, what do we call hive tours, which is like an experience. It's a, the opportunity for someone to be a beekeeper for a couple hours. You come out, you yeah. learn about bees, you get to put on a suit and get into a hive. And yeah. in a world where um, everyone's touting experiences over stuff, it's yeah. been really successful. That's awesome. Let's talk about bees a little bit. So bees are uh, a very important. They're not just another insect, right? They're very important to a lot of different things. Uh, and you can probably talk about this for six hours, but it, well, uh, I, in five to 10 minutes, can you tell me why bees are important? What is it about them that makes them such an important part of ecosystems and what's going on with bees today? Yeah, I was actually at, it's funny you say that I was at a restaurant, one of the restaurants here in town, Emmer yeah. and Rye uses a fair bit of our honey. And I was doing a workshop for their staff last week and I had 30 minutes and we were well over 30 minutes. And I looked at the chef and I said, you're just going to have to cut me because they're going to continue to ask questions and we could be here all day. Yeah. And so more than 80% of the world's flowering crops are reliant upon bees. Now it's important to clarify that I'm not just talking about honeybees here. There's honeybees aren't native to North America, but there's 7,000 species of bees that are. Mm. So you've got all sorts of, of different, um, bees that go out and pollinate crops, right? So pollination of course is what allows our, um, uh, a plant to produce a uh, fruit or a vegetable to produce a seed to propagate, right? And so you'll hear the, you know, one out of every three bites um, that the world produces um, that you find in the grocery store is reliant upon bees. Is that right? That, I know. Yeah, that probably comes from that, that they're responsible for pollinating 80% of the, of the world's crops, mm-hmm. right? So um, very important. Now, again, honeybees aren't the only game in town. There's, all, like, there's, a, there's literally a bee called the squash bee, and they only pollinate squash plants. So different bees have different uh-huh. body types and are able to pollinate different, time, different types of, of uh, flowers, right? Um, but honeybees are the ones that we hear about the most often because honeybees are the only species of bees that we can pack on the back of semis and drive around for pollination services, mm. right? So um, when you hear- so they're more resilient. It's not that they're more resilient. It's just that they're, the way that they're set up is very different. So when you hear people say, without honeybees, we wouldn't have almonds. Okay, that's not true. There okay. are other bees that pollinate almonds, but our form of modern day farming um, does not lend itself uh, uh, to a world without driving bees around. So like, California grows 80% of the world's almonds. Okay. Yep. There are not enough bees occurring naturally in nature in the state of California to pollinate 80% of the world's almonds. It's just unnatural. It doesn't work that way. Right. So the only way that we can pollinate those crops is for every beekeeper in this nation that makes their money off pollination services. And that's a lot. There's something like 1 million hives are moved into California in January to pollinate the almonds. Okay. So other bees can pollinate almonds, except they don't live in big colonies that we can drive around. Mm-hmm. Okay. They live, they're called, what are called solitary bees. More like nomad, like, um, you know. Yeah, they're solitary bees. So they live um, in flower, like in different reeds or they nest in the ground, but they can't be managed like livestock. Got it. Right. These big honeybee colonies that are driven around are basically livestock. Yeah. We can't manage other bee species in this way. It just so happens that the honeybees like to assemble in a particular way that makes it. Massive colonies, right? right. Up to 50, 60,000 bees. Yeah in a hive and that's crazy so when you move the hive all the bees go after it like the bees don't they're not like oh i'm just gonna hang out here oh no so they'll close up the hives um in a way so that you know the bees aren't just gonna fly out and then they'll put them on some eyes and then they'll drive them around they put giant and nets then how do you collect the bees again um, oh they put nets over them. they put giant nets over over the hives yeah so it's a whole it's a whole process. But then when you have to let them fly around to pollinate yeah. things. So when they when they land on the farm, they'll pull them off the back of the truck and yeah, uh, yeah, and they'll like, they'll leave the hive and come back at the end of the day. Fly little honeybee. Yeah. And then the bee has to fly around from tree to tree. Mm-hmm. And then how do you collect all the bees back? Yeah, they go back to their home. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. that's what. I, yeah. So that's what yeah, I was getting. Yeah, they go back okay. to their home. Okay, and then 
they go back to the home. But you probably a couple of bees that get left behind every time. Oh, always. Um, What's that? Driving bees. Is, is there a bees, kids movie about this? Dri- <laughs> <laughs> there is the bee movie, and it's wrong in every way possible. Is it okay? <laughs> yeah, the bee, the bee movie. You know, in a hive, all the females do all of the work. Uh-huh. Men have sex, and then they like the the males have sex, and then they die, and that's it. And in the <laughs> bee movie, you know, the the ones that go out and collect the food every day are these like big muscly men, and mm. I'm like, I just always think, what a missed opportunity right like what an opportunity that we had to yeah. like empower little girls and instead we squashed it and we just make it big muscly men that do mm. all the work when really females in the hive perform all of the functions i have yeah. you thought about writing a children's book about this <laughs> we do there's lots of children books out there but i feel like we need one with like a lady beekeeper yeah lady beekeeper yeah. and if it would be like about yeah. that I, yeah. I think there's something yeah, there i think so your, I, we have we your have thought about it. little girl's <laughs> education program goes through your book nobody's still that yeah <laughs> well i mean I, I'm a big fan of like, you can't really steal ideas. You can only steal execution, right? And execution is yours. So oh, you can. For sure. We've got, you know, on that point, we've, we've been put in that position many a time. We yeah. are an organization that's, we're fluid and we're flexible and we can bend. And um, we are constantly coming up with unique ideas. And we've got a lot of people that, you know, I've had my website copy mm-hmm. copied word for word on some of the things oh. and that's frustrating yeah. right that's frustrating but you can't you can't you can't copy you can't trademark an idea yeah but um it can be very frustrating and can get you down but i always say as long as you're riding my coattails you know where you are behind me there you go Boom. And also you can't copy you. I mean, all the stuff that you do, no. you know, that's, that's, yeah. the, that's the most important And we thing. all take inspiration from everywhere, and, right? And I doubt that whoever copy your website has as strong a deadlift and back squat as you do. Also true. <laughs> <laughs> Though I, I will say, you know, before I started this business, I was a hell of a lot stronger than I am now. And it's, it's a, my own personal demon that I have to fight. Really? But, but you train at Atomic. I, mean, uh, I do, but I mean, I don't get in, yeah. you know, like I work, I mean, if, if you're interested in starting a business, like don't be fooled. You are, people are like, oh, you work from home. I'm like, you act like I'm sitting around like eating bonbons, watching soap operas. Like <laughs> I 100% work more hours than anyone that I know, yeah. right? It just, that, that's just the nature of the business. I'm trying to get better at it and build yeah. a more accountable team. But you know, I, my summers, I'm outside for anywhere from six to eight, nine hours a day in a hundred degree heat. Yeah. Okay. To turn around and then go to Atomic, you know, and do yeah. a very hard workout is very tough. And so my goal is to, you know, I get in twice a week. I used to get in four and I struggled with that for a long time. And Todd that owns Atomic pulled me aside once when I was being very hard on myself because my, my back squat dropped a fair bit. And I was a little bit frustrated with like some aesthetic issues. And he said, first of all, you look great. And anyone that knows Todd know if you're going fishing for compliments, you don't go to Todd. He's yeah. not one that's going to yeah. like, he was on the show. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not one that's going to like, um, join in and like, you know, boosting you up just for boosting you up sake. But he said, first of all, you look great. Second of all, you work a job of manual labor you know you work harder than everyone else in here in your day job the fact that you came in right now Mm -hmm. you already win yeah he's really great with that so i've had to like accept that that's the way that it is and sometimes sometimes i mean it's happened to me last night last night uh i went into that the mastodon complex workout after the tuesday workout and i i just sucked i was terrible i was just like i had the worst workout i've had in six months and in terms of performance and you know what? I, the only thing I can do is go home, eat, drink, like water, take, you know, uh, get some sleep and come back right. again either today or tomorrow. And, it's been and a great lesson in humility and like yeah. accepting your limits. And I think that's really important. And that's why I love, I love the gym so much. Um, because, you know, two years ago, even maybe a year ago, I would go in and just do it anyway and, and push and then get injured. And like, it sucks to get injured for anyone. Mm -hmm. But then when I have to turn around and harvest 60 pound boxes of honey the next day, Mm -hmm. I don't have that option to be injured. And so when I came in for that exact same workout this week, my right thought, my quads just killing me. And so I did kettlebell yeah. front squats i didn't get under the bar that was the wise thing to do i can't say that i've always been wise about my workouts and but i've really come around and yeah. I'm like it is what it is i'm here yeah. to like stay fit so that i can get out in the b yard tomorrow yeah and i mean there are there are people 
who are, I mean, in order to continue to work out and continue to be strong and healthy for a long time as you age, you have to be wise about things because you're not, you know, you're not made out of stainless steel. Right. I mean, I'm not old, but like, you know, I am 37 and, um, that's not terribly young <laughs> in terms of the kind of things we do at that gym. I, yeah. The, the things we do at the gym are a little unreasonable at times, but <laughs> I'll take it. I mean, we all, we all show up voluntarily. So, um, why is there such a difference? And this is something that I wrote and has a question ahead of time because I didn't know, like, why is it like you can have honeys that are produced relatively close to each other? So you're talking about North Loop versus mm-hmm. South Austin. I mean, that's like five miles. That's not far from each other. But the honeys taste very different. They can. Why? Um, different flowers make different honeys. Yeah. So if you've got, you know, a ton of rosemary that happens to be blooming um, in South Austin and the bees are visiting those rosemary, yeah. uh, flowers. And then maybe in North loop, you know, North, the North loop site is very near several nurseries. Mm. And so perhaps they've got, I don't know, they got about a sun, a bunch of sunflowers out, you know, okay. and the bees are visiting that, that honey is very different because those nectars are very different, mm-hmm. um, in all the attributes and color and flavor. And so, um, when you harvest in large batches and you throw everything together, you lose out on that. But because we harvest in such itty bitty batches, you get that appreciation for the rainbow of colors and flavors in honey. Is that differentiation part of why you can charge so much more for your product? I think the different, I I think it's it's several things. Um, I think people love the neighborhood aspect okay. to be able to pick up a product and say, you know, and it says this was these, this honey was produced in North loop and you have some connection to that neighborhood. Yeah. Um, I think that's huge. And again, going back to, you know, I think we've just done a very good job with our branding, our packaging. I am very particular. My honey won't just go in any jar and it's an mm-hmm. ongoing battle because our jars, um, we can't really ship them because they aren't leak proof. Right. Ooh. They are beautiful, but they are not leak proof. And it's a very simple solution. If you look at it one way, we'll just buy one of those little hexagon jars that the lid screws on. And I won't do it because part of the reason that people love us is our product is very we good have, looking. Is, is that what this is on the table here? It is. Yeah. This oh, is wow. one of them. This is a coincidence, but okay. And so tell me more. So I'm holding a jar here. That's a beautiful jar. It's got a lid that closes with a clasp system and a rubber gasket. Yeah, it's a bale jar, if anyone's familiar. Yeah, okay. it's a bale jar. Bale jar. Um, but, you know, all, uh, we have other jars that have corks and they have little wooden spoons attached. And so mm. I've put a lot of work into selecting our packaging. Wow. The, the thing about that is that you can buy that and you can take that home and you can gift that. You can make give that as a gift. Yeah. And that is a beautiful gift to it give. It is a beautiful gift. It's got a honeycomb the, on the top, too. It does, yeah. It's got a honeycomb and then what a is, bit of honey. What is the retail price for this? That one, we sell for 20 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. And it's five ounces of honey. So we, get, we fetch $4 an ounce. Okay. Um, so that... I'll have to get one of these before that, <laughs> that, I think that's the key is that our product is one that you feel really good about gifting that to someone. We sell more honey direct to consumer in the month of December than we sell the entire rest of the year combined. So, okay, we gifting. move a lot of honey. Um, and the neighborhood aspect makes it even really special too. And honey like doesn't go bad, 15, right? It doesn't go bad. That also behooves us. I do. I can't imagine having to do all that I do and manage all that I manage. And then also think about shelf life. Perishability. Good yeah. gravy. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can't. So we are fortunate that our honey, you know, is never going to spoil, but we sell through every harvest, which brings a unique set of challenges. People say, oh, that's great. But really, I mean, we do a good job of making sure people don't forget about us, right? So we'll probably sell through, I've got a very large order coming in um, this month. We're probably going to be completely out of honey by the end of February. We won't have any more until June. At the so earliest. I'm gonna have to. I better I'm take two jars it. today. <laughs> get yeah. on it now. Wow. So that if you utilize that properly, that can be a great thing for you, right? That that urgency is always great, but yeah. people can also forget about you, or wholesale retailers can grow frustrated with you. So yeah. the onus is on me to educate people that listen. This is a seasonal product; mm-hmm. it lasts all year. But just like strawberries are seasonal, we can only get honey about six weeks out of the year. That's it. And that has to last us the whole rest of the year. And if some weather catastrophe happens like it did in the fall, well, we're not going to have as much as we Mm. had hoped. 
we have a lot of educating we have to do yeah. constantly. What percentage of your sales are direct versus through wholesale? So you sell at uh, different uh, supermarkets and things like that? We don't sell at supermarkets. Um, we sell at, so we sell wholesale retail to like Antonelli's Cheese mm. here in Austin, big cheese shop. They sell more than probably anyone else or, okay. they, or they buy more wholesale retail yeah, from anyone else. people pair cheeses with honey. For sure. Yeah. 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 It, and it's an artisanal product and they sort of focus on, um, you know, farmstead and artisanal yeah. products. Um, we sell had a lot of gift shops, a lot of gift shops on the east side of Austin sell our honey. So you'll walk into this gift shop and there'll be jewelry and clothes and candles and then our honey's on the shelf. So okay. we our honey can fit a lot of different kinds of markets unlike other food products. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So and what so what percentage do you sell direct versus through other people? Um I would say probably it's it's definitely different this year. We're probably at a 60% direct, 40% wholesale retail, I would say. Okay. Okay. So, and they're both important parts of your business, right? Because For sure. The, the 60% that's direct has higher margins. Yes. But it is uh, it is also um, less predictable probably than the... Well, it's that we can't... If you're running your business in a vacuum, you've already screwed up, right? So, like, I always tell people, the best advice I can give you is find someone or someone's that shares your customer or shares your ideal customer and is not your competitor mm. and you go to them and you chat with them and you partner with them you cross pollinate for so sure let's, let's there you go <laughs> not technically a bee pun we'll, 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 we'll let it slide let it slide and um, but that is you know that partnership with Antonelli's cheese. And so people that aren't familiar with them, yeah. they are the cheese game in Austin, which yeah. sounds a little bit silly, but like they are it. They are very well known in this town. Yeah. And they were the first ones to buy our honey. The, the, when we were able to say Antonelli's cheese carries our honey, it gives us a gravitas and a weight to our product mm. that we wouldn't have had before. And yeah. we've done that time and again, we're constantly partnering with um, different um, other businesses that again aren't competitors, but we yeah. have the same customer. And now we're at a point where, you know, when we when I first started out, it was always me going to bigger fish, right? Oh, I'd love to partner with you. And but now, like we've gotten, we're we're well enough known that I try to do that for others. Mm-hmm. So for smaller businesses that are maybe a little bit behind me. Um, at every step, I'm a huge supporter of female owned businesses. It's very important to me. Yeah. Um, and so I'm constantly trying to find and help others, not just women, yeah. men too, but smaller businesses that are in our world that share our values of Definitely. ethics and sustainability, um, and local, like I want to push those businesses and partner with them and share my customer base that maybe three, four, five, six, ten 10 times what they have so that my customers can learn about them. And I think that my customers love that about yeah. us. And they expect that they expect me to say, Hey, you guys check out this new product that I've on. They're brand new in Austin woman owned. You won't regret it. Check them out. And they expect that from me, right? Mm-hmm. That's one of the commitments that I've made unspoken commitments to my customers that I'm going to introduce you to small owned businesses that you should know about. That's awesome. And I think Austin is really funny. We just had actually, is it this week's or last week's episode? Uh, last week's episode, Kara Cotta, Kara Pendle, she does uh, ceramics mm-hmm. and it was an amazing, amazing episode. And yeah, we talk a lot about, you know, manifesting your, your outcomes and, and, and transforming your art into, into a business. But yeah, I've, I'm always looking for women-owned businesses to to highlight, and I think it's really, really important to to do that. And it's cool that you've made it a part of your, it's almost like what we do with this podcast with small businesses in general, but you're doing it with women-owned businesses in, in, in Texas. And, and it definitely, when people um, think of this podcast, they're like, okay, it's all about small business. I'm not going out and inter- interviewing, you know, big corporations or big businesses. It's all it's it's good for people to kind of point at you and know you for something, right? Yeah, it's really important. And you know, like it's in a way it's paying it, it's kind of paying it back and paying it forward, yeah. right? Because so many people um, took a chance on me and mm-hmm. pay a lot more, you know, for my honey. Um, now that being said, they're paying for really beautiful packaging. They're paying, they know no one treats their bees better than I do. I have the most organic and most sustainable practices, right? But I had so many people that took a chance on me in terms of my customer base. Yeah. Um, and so I want to share that, you know, with other people. And so in my own life, it's very important to me to shop locally as much as I can. Sometimes it's financially prohibitive for people, mm-hmm. right? But 
I'm always trying to impart upon folks like you do what you can, but if you recognize the importance of that, yeah. a lot of times that's enough if you can't financially do that every time you go out because yeah. you're going to share that with your children. You're going to share that value with your friends. You know, when, when someone buys a gift from me, mm -hmm. I tell them you've done so much more than if you just bought honey for me and you took it home Yeah, because you're going to take that jar and you're going to give it to your friend or your sister or your mom. And perhaps your mom didn't know about me. Yep. So not only have you financially supported me, you shared me uh, you've shared our message and what we do with somebody else. Yeah. And then who knows where that might take us. Let me propose an alternative w way to view what you just said, because I also t support, uh, you know, local as much as possible. Uh, and it is sometimes more expensive, right? Especially if you go to the grocery store and you're like, oh, my grocery bill is higher than if I were to go and, you know, buy it from somewhere with a national chain. However, there are trade-offs that you can make. So, for example, if you cook at home instead of going out, and you can afford to get, you know, it, you save so much money by cooking at home. I mean, I cook 95% of the time and I love to cook. Um, but you save so much money by doing that that you can afford to buy a little bit, you know, more expensive ingredients. And then you get higher quality food and you can buy local, right? So there are trade-offs that you can make in your life to do that kind of thing. For sure. And I mean, when you're talking about buying from the local food supply, that's a whole other discussion, right? Like right. I was talking broadly about like gifts or candles or whatever supporting sure. local businesses. But when you're talking about suppo supporting oh, local farms. for some reason, farms, I, I, my mind went to food. Yeah, because okay. yeah. you're staring at yeah, yeah. But yeah, when you're supporting local farms, yeah. I mean, that's something that we talk about you know, a great deal. Not only if you support a local farm, mm -hmm. you're supporting that farmer, but think about it. You're also providing, if you care about bees yeah. and you shop from the middle of the grocery store, which is basically owned by Monsanto, yeah. who douses everything they have in pesticides that are killing bees, mm -hmm. what good have you done? Yeah. <laughs> right. And so if you're supporting a local farmer, that it's only next second to supporting your local beekeeper, supporting your local farmers is the best thing that you can do to support our bee population because yeah. they are the ones that are giving our bees good, clean food to eat free from pesticides, right? They're taking care of the water. Yeah. They're taking care of the soil. And yes, it is more expensive. And I understand that's not feasible for everybody, but there's also a health trade off, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and even beyond that, like if you've never had organic blueberries and then you have organic blueberries like the difference is night and day so i applaud stores like walmart who's done a lot for providing fresh produce to food deserts right so like i grew up in a food desert in rural west texas i won't eat the vegetables when i go home because i'm used to a very different quality like it just tastes bad but it makes you realize like when you're providing these vegetables to these people that live in these food deserts no wonder they don't want to eat them because they don't they're not as good i mean they don't know how to cook them right so there's a whole myriad of issues associated yeah. with that yeah. but i w i just want people to associate food with health more yeah. right we'll go and we'll buy a damn 12 dollar cocktail and then we'll bitch about buying a dozen eggs that cost four dollars yeah, yeah you know what i mean and so we buy the two dollar uh box instead like there's a health trade-off in terms of what you're buying and what you're putting into your body and that's a connection that so many people are missing yeah and yes i mean so many things are associated with that i mean mental health is associated physical health mental health is associated with your food food supply and your food like everything you eat and For sure. and as i've traveled around the country it's I've seen the differences in different uh, areas of the country and like how people uh, like the things that people have access to. So it's yeah. uh, and it can be very overwhelming when you want to like do good things. I want to support local producers. I want to eat good food. I, you know, you want to do all these good things. It can be so overwhelming, and yeah. I don't want that. I don't want anyone to walk away from me with a you know a feeling of just I'm overwhelmed and I feel a bit helpless. Yep. So I tell people like educating yourself number one and number two, do what you can. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you can't. If you can't buy your entire grocery list from the farmer's market, that's okay. Yeah. But like, maybe you really like eggs. Go support your, your, or buy 20% of your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just do what you can and feel really good about that. Yeah. And then someday maybe you can do more. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. What role does social media play? And so a lot of the stuff we're talking about here is centers on story, right? So the neighborhood story, the story of the bees, the story mm -hmm. of everything that, that even even you going back to the, the early in the interview and talking about, uh, you know, Afghanistan and CIA 
and you know talking about your deadlift and your squat and the, you know the, the violet comment uh, it, it all kind of ties story together and story is something that you are also sending out to the world through your social media so what how do you think about that and what role does that play in your uh, in your marketing and reaching out to your consumers it's ironic because i am not a producer nor much of a consumer for social on social media like personally mm-hmm. i never really have been um, so on some level, it feels a little bit like heavy <laughs> yeah. for me to have to do that, but it is so important. Instagram has been such an important factor, yeah. um, for us. Um, and it, it almost happened by accident. It's not like I set out with this like strategy of how I was going to handle our Instagram. Yeah. I just started talking from my own voice and sharing, you know, ridiculous stories. Like the time I split my pants out working bees, like that got shared and who doesn't <laughs> love to hear about a girl splitting her pants, you know, like, um, I don't buy into the, like, everything is perfect on Instagram and let's share it. I share fun stuff and good things. And I share when things go wrong. And yeah. I think there's like this want and this need for that authenticity. Um, and people being very genuine. And so that's what I've done and it's worked really well. And so Instagram is very important for us. We see a direct connection when I post something about a class, et cetera. We see a spike in registrations for that class. Mm -hmm. So Instagram is great. I've grown to love it. We didn't do a lot of Facebook initially, um, but it's growing increasingly more important, particularly in terms of classes because Mm. I think the Facebook events portion of the site um, I think people go to that to look for what to do this weekend, right? So every single event and class that we do, whether it's paid or it's free, we post it on Facebook and it has been really critical in us filling the seats here in our classroom. So uh, those are both really, really important. That's awesome. That's awesome. Can you t- think of a time when things went really wrong with the business and what you do about it? You know, like things go wrong all the time. <laughs> yeah. Like all the time. I think about, I was just chatting with a female yesterday um, who just started her own business. And I said, listen, things feel really hard. Your problems feel really hard. It never gets easier. Mm-hmm. It's just like weightlifting. Right? It never gets easier. Mm. Just the problems that you can tackle and the yeah, weight that you can move yeah. becomes harder. Mm-hmm. Right. I think about the problems that I had, you know, even like a year ago and I think, oh, I'd kill for those set of problems because <laughs> <Yeah, exactly. laughs> they're today they're so much more complicated. Um, But I would say probably the lowest point in the business, and I haven't shared this with anyone publicly before, so I want to tread a bit carefully, but um, there is a a person that owns a, I guess you would say a competing business, a hunting business, um, and it several times has made um, slanderous completely untrue remarks about our product. Mm. Um, The first time it happened, I had literally just gotten started. I hadn't even sold any honey yet, Mm -hmm. which made it very ironic and it was very peculiar. Um, And I just walked away because what was I going to do at that point, right? I didn't, no one even knew my name, Mm -hmm. Um, but it was really scary. What did they say? Um, That I was selling fake honey. Oh, fake honey? I know. What does that even mean? Well, well, you a lot of the honey in the grocery stores is cut with high fructose corn syrup. So that's a real thing. That's oh. called adulterated honey. Yeah. I wasn't even selling honey at the time. It yeah. was clearly a scare tactic, right? Mm. It was a scare tactic. I walked away. Um, and then um, much more recently um, made some remarks um, to a market that we were both in. Um, that, uh, and I don't, I don't want to get too far into the details. I think that the sort of high level, like what I w- took away from it is more important, but made again, very untrue, um, unsupported claims, um, that that market immediately acknowledged as being untrue. Um, and you know, think about it, like you've worked, you know, I'd worked so hard to build this business and then to have someone that's much bigger than me making some claims. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really scary. And I was, I was in this position where I'm like, what am I going to do? Legal action? Is that, do I want to take legal action? Um, do I want to stay in the market? Do I want to leave the market? I wasn't happy with how it was eventually handled at the market. Um, don't think that they thought it was as big of a deal as I did. And um, I chose to walk away. Mm. So I'm in this position where I'm turning down a very important revenue stream and more importantly, exposure. Um, and I just ultimately decided that I'm not going to get in the mud with a bully. My energy and time is much better spent 
doing what I do every day, which is providing a phenomenal product that's mm-hmm. ethically and sustainably sourced mm-hmm. and educating my community and beyond about why bees are important, why we should be take better care of our earth, why we should be nicer to our environment. That is where my energy is best spent. So I decided to walk, but it was a very hard road that mm. I traveled to get there. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. That sounds, yeah, that sounds, that sounds challenging for sure. Is there anything else that you want you, um, our audience to know about you? Where can people find you if they're interested in learning more? Yeah. About you? So we are on Instagram. I say, if you're on Instagram, start there. Um, we are at two hives, spell out the number two. Okay. Um, if you ever start a business, don't include a number in the business name because forever until the day you die, you're going to say, and spell out the two. Yeah, instead <laughs> of putting the two. Yeah. <laughs> Not the numeric, yeah. but spell it out. So we're at two hives. Mm-hmm. Um, our website, twohiveshoney.com. You can sign up for our newsletter there. Okay. Um, we share, we don't sell in our newsletter. We're always yeah. sharing fun and interesting things. Um, yeah. And I think those are probably the best places to find us. We have a shop here in Austin okay. um, that you can come and visit us. We sell all the beekeeping equipment. We do classes. We also do lots of free classes that aren't necessarily geared just towards beekeepers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Africanized bees, the killer bees everyone's terrified about. We've got a class about that in yeah. February. So check us out on our offerings online. Come see us and have a free honey tasting. That's awesome. Actually, before we sign off, you mentioned newsletter. I recently had an, uh, a gentleman named Paul Jarvis who just wrote a book called Company of One, and he, he has a uh, newsletter where 95% of his business comes from selling to his newsletter. How have you grown your newsletter? Can you give maybe actionable yeah. tips for other small business owners to grow their newsletter and how they can uh, do that? Yeah, I will say I need to do more about just adding numbers, but I will say this. The number of people on that list are not is not what's important. Yeah. Your open rate... Yeah. People that are actually open. So if you're sending your newsletter out to 20,000 people, but only 500 or you know 300 are opening it, yeah. it doesn't really mean much, yeah. right? Our open rate's really high. It's close to 40%, wow. which is astronomical. And our unsubscribe rate is very low. Yeah. And so I would say, look at that. Look at the right metrics, okay. right? Um, and you gotta, f- I think it's just like any social media. You gotta find your voice that's right for you and your business. So my newsletter, I write it. It comes from me, um, Find, speaking in the first person directly from me is what works for me. Yeah. I sign it, Tara. It comes from my email. In every single newsletter, I throw something out and encourage people to come back at me. And I say, I don't know, you know, I, I've just start, started composting and I'm, I'm sure that it's really hard and I have no idea what to put in the bin and what to go <laughs> in the trash. And I'll say, yeah. you got any tips? Share them with me. Awesome. And you'd be shocked at the number of people that hit reply and talk to me as if we know one another. Sounds like, good. So many times I have to Google, like I put their email in my Gmail and I look like, have we talked before? Because they'll say, hey, me and, me and Amanda are going to come see you at the shop next week. And and I feel like, do we know each other? But yeah. I think they feel like they know me. And that's great that we can make that connection. That's awesome. Terry Don Chapman, you are very, very, very impressive. And it's you're doing some really amazing things for the community, not only on the B side, on the entrepreneurship, on the women business side. So uh, keep fighting the good fight. And thank you so much for sharing your story on Small Business War Stories. Thanks for having me. It's always so fun to like kind of look back and think about the... It's a good time to think about lessons that we've learned. So I appreciate that opportunity. Sounds good. Thank you thank so much. Thank you. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.